Okay. All right, Ray, thank you so much for joining us and, and being willing to be our first person today. We're just very excited to have you with us. Um, you have just so much to share with us in such a short time that we're just going to start right away, if you don't mind, and I'll jump I right in. I don't mind, and you stop me when you want and move me on. Okay. Before you tell us, though, what happened to you and your family during the Holocaust and the war, tell us first a little bit about your family, your community, and your life before the war began in September 1939. I'll tell you as much as I recall, and a lot of what happened later were basically from my mother's memory and my conversations with her. From what I remember, I had a pretty posh life. Both my parents had businesses. My mother had a fabric store. She sold to the community, and she also sold wholesale to smaller communities. She had traveled a lot to buy the fabric. She used to buy it by the bolt and then distribute some and sell some in her store. My father had multiple interests. He had a butcher shop because he supplied uh, meat to the, we had a, an army garrison uh, just outside the town because we were just four kilometers from the Russian border. Um, some of the meat he would sell in the store because Jews were only allowed a certain amount of meat and in the Jewish religion, we're only allowed to eat the forefront of the animal and not the backside. On the contrary, the military wanted the flesh <coughs> from beyond the waist. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was very lucrative for him because he was not limited. Just the amount that he had to slaughter to have supplied the military. Uh, kosher is normally um, slaughtered in a certain way, and it, it, was, it was an arrangement that allowed him to use the kosher slaughter. Uh, he also used to purchase the produce from farmers of apples, flax, and sometimes even uh, animals, mostly pigs, to ship to Germany. He never went into Germany, he would just deliver it to the border. And the cars, the um, railroad cars, would be picked up and taken further. Um, I was raised by nannies, <laughs> maids. We didn't call them maids at that time. I had what we call the governors, and so did my brother. My brother was much younger. And so he did not advance to a governess yet. Uh, life at home was very comfortable until the Russians occupied our part of the country. Ray, before we go there, um, you lost your father very young. Yes. Tell us, tell us a, what you can about, about what you know about why he died, but also what you remember of him, which I know isn't a lot. I remember mostly a picture that hung in the living room, mm -hmm. a portrait really, and that was from the age of 20. He was 37 when he died. One of his trips delivering to Germany, he stopped in a city where he was told they were Jews, that was 1937, where they were Jews in, housed in a warehouse, and needless to say, he was interested what was happening. It seems that Germany had expelled uh, those that came from Eastern European countries, mostly, that came to settle in Germany for economic reasons, and some of them for education. Uh, even students that were there on visas, studying at the German universities, were expelled. Needless to say, they've been away from home for a long time. I had no specific house to go to. And so they were housed in a warehouse, 
conditions in the warehouse were not very sanitary and many of them got sick. My father happened to have been unlucky enough to catch one of the infections and even though he went to many doctors, they could not do anything for him. It was pre-penicillin era. And so he passed away at the age of 37. One, one of the things I remember you sharing with me um, was that you had a memory of going with him to buy apples. <laughs> the only memory I really have of my father is that he took me to one of the orchards where he was negotiating to buy the produce, the apples from the orchard. And at night I remember that we were higher up and we looked down into the valley, and, uh, which was the Russian side. And they were really um, celebrating. Well, gathered, my father told me they gather in the evening and they play the harmonicas and the accordions and they sing. And I watched it, and it kind of ingrained into my memory. I thought they were very happy people. I found out differently once the Russians occupied our part. Uh, our town was the seat of the area. I guess here you would call it a county. Like a, it's like a county. Uh, like a county. And um, so the officers were there, and a big contingent of Russians that came with the occupation, had expelled some people from their houses, so they would take over the dwellings. And the first thing I remember is that we had to share our house with some people who were misplaced from their homes. Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't so bad either, but the house was big enough. There were actually two parts to the house because my grandmother, my father's mother, lived with us. The store was in the very front, which was attached to the house. There was my father's office. And they occupied mostly that part of the house. We had the back of the house were our quarters, my parents and my brother and I. But my mother had to uh, close the store she was astute enough to know that everything would be taken. And so she very quickly distributed a lot of the fabrics to farmers that were friends and clients, customers, with the understanding that they would supply us with some necessities, food, of course. Um, many of them used to buy fabrics from the store because in those days, and I'm sure here in the United States, to a great extent too, people did not have department stores to go to. And so they had to buy the fabric and sew their own clothing. Um, we had a very good relationship with the surrounding farmers. I remember spending a pre-Christmas Eve helping to decorate a Christmas tree. I was probably about six at the time. And I remember what ornaments we made. I remember that we had to blow out eggs by making a hole in one end and a hole in the bottom of it and blow it out and then draw a face, put on a hat with a string to hang on the tree. And also, cranberries were in season. Uh, the area around us is very marshy and produced a lot of cranberries. And we, of course, strung cranberries to hung, hang on the tree. So that'll give you an idea how we interacted with the community people there. Also, my father was very good friends with um, a priest. He called him, we called him Batushka, which is father in Belarus. It was, he was the priest in the um, Russian Orthodox Church. There was also a Catholic Church. But uh, this particular man, this priest, had honey bees and hives. And I remember taking him matzah during the Passover Seder, the Passover time, and he would give me honey. So some memories from way, way back. Ray, when, um, when the Soviets occupied 
um, your town in, in September of 1939. What were some of the changes that were forced on you by the Soviets? You, um, well, the first change was that my mother had to close the store and she was also running the business that my father had with the help of some of her siblings and her father. And of course, that was closed too. So uh, income was not coming in and that's why it helped that we, she had the arrangement with the farmers to supply us with some of the foods and necessities. And you were forced to go to Russian school, right? I was forced to go to a Russian school. I had attended, actually, my true birth year is 1932, but I'll tell you later what happened, why it's 1930. Uh, I was put in school at the age of three in a Hebrew private school. Uh, I seem to have been a good kid and paid attention to studies. And so I was fortunate enough to have some education before the Russians came in. Russian school was a lot different. In the first place, I had to start communicating in Russian. I knew some of it because Belarus, which is the colloquial, was the colloquial language, and it's very similar to Polish, uh, is similar to Russian, and I could pick up the language. I guess I was fortunate enough to be able to pick up some Russian. School was a lot different. Well, it was for two reasons. One of them was because I was Jewish, and I had never attended a public school. Second of all, because there was dual discrimination. Uh, there was discrimination to Jews that I didn't feel at that time as much until the Russians came in, and more so because I was more exposed to the public. Mm -hmm. Somehow, the resentment of Jews, and I should say quote unquote hate, was instilled to kids in a, at a young age. And the Russian kids were not very kind to the Polish kids or to the Jewish kids. Uh, the town had a population of around 5,000. About, I'd say, almost half of the population was Jewish, mostly merchants and uh, tradespeople. Uh, religion was forbidden in Russia. It was a secular state. The thing that was predominant is indoctrination. The first thing was a competition to become part of the Russian system of children uh, belonging to a certain group, an organization. You had to excel in something and you had to be <coughs> Uh, cognizant or your parents had to be sympathetic to the communists. And I remember as both what they call a bourgeois because my parents were business people and Jewish, obtaining the red kerchief to designate you as a pioneer, the lowest of the Russian denominations to, of indoctrination, you had to be a communist, of course, and excel in education. Well, that I could manage, excel in education. And I finally got my little red kerchief. I came home with it and my mother was as mad as can be. Why did you even try for it? That I remember. I could only put it on in school. God forbid if I should put it on at home. Great, so my great. achievement was but not very much uh, encouraged in that. Ray, before we turn to when the, when the Nazis came, one more question about the, um, or comment about when, when you were under the Russians. You mentioned that you were considered bourgeois. Um, you were, your mother was fearful that you would actually be shipped to Siberia. Uh, the Russians had started, they actually deported about 10 families to Siberia. Uh, basically to take over their dwellings and whatever they owned. And my mother was very fearful that we would be deported too. 
and so we were packed. Uh, you could only take whatever belongings. When they came for you, you could only take whatever you could put into something. Most of the people didn't have suitcases. Fortunately, my mother had some, but that, that was not a good sign either. So I remember they put it in pillowcases. So we were packed in case we were deported because we knew that Siberia was very cold, so warm clothing was prepared. So we kind of were sitting at the edge of our seats. And as, as I think, also, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry, Ray. Also, they confiscated a lot of things. The Russian soldiers would come in and whatever caught their attention, especially, I remember this very clearly, a clock an alarm clock that my father brought from one, one of his travels. And actually, one of the soldiers picked it up, strapped it onto his wrist, because they called it chassis, a, a watch. It was 1939, and uh, radio clocks, even thermometers, were not very available. And so they pilfered whatever they could. You, you, would, you would live under the Soviets for the, the, almost about, well, about a year and a half, maybe even longer. Almost, almost, almost two, two years. years. In June 1941, of course, the, the Nazis turned on the Soviets, and your town was occupied by the Germans. Um, by the end of 1941, you and other Jews in Dokshitsi were forced into a ghetto. Tell us about that, Ray. Well, when the Nazis first came in, believe it or not, they were throwing candy off their tanks. Mm. And we've already been aware of what they were doing in Poland because some people that escaped the Nazis from Poland came to the town. Uh, that was before the concentration camps yet. And after being under the Russian rule for a little bit, they went back. They said it's better there than it is here because they couldn't get work. They didn't have anything and the Russians were not very uh, accommodating. And so when the Nazis came in, nobody thought it was going to be so bad. But within about a month, or a little bit more than a month, uh, the black shirts came in, what we call the black shirts, were the um, Nazi propaganda group. They started to incite the public against the Jews, and the Jews had to identify themselves by wearing the yellow star. It had to be pinned on the left side in the front, the right side in the back, on all garments. Well, it started in the summer, the, actually fall, and when it got cold, it had to be in, in, on inner and outer clothing. Uh, if a soldier or anybody really walked on the sidewalk and wanted to push you off into the gutter, there was no, no remorse. And some of the kids that I knew from school would spit at me would shove me. These are kids you had gone to school with? Kids that I had gone to school yeah. with. I was afraid they really didn't want to go out in the street. Right. You, um, you shared with me that... Okay, the ghetto. Before you get to the ghetto, I want to ask okay. you something you shared with me. When the Germans first came in, a German officer was housed with your grandfather. You remember <laughs> to, to keep me on track. <laughs> uh, during the First World War, uh, the Germans were very, um, how should I say, they were mild for soldiers. And a soldier that was stationed and happened to have uh, his quarters in my grandparents' house, because soldiers were stationed in different houses too, that my grandfather had become quite friendly with, came, happened to have stayed in the army and achieved higher rank, and came in with the occupied forces. Mm -hmm. My grandfather saw him and he recognized my grandfather. 
my grandfather was tall from what I remember, and uh, some of the uh, non-Jewish kids referred to him as Moses. His name was Aaron. He, had, he was tall, he wore a long gray coat, he had a beard, he was very distinguished looking. And he recognized my grandfather. My grandfather looked and, I mean, the man was a high-ranking high official. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather kind of hesitated to approach him. He quickly told him, he says, I'll come to visit you at home. Now you don't know me. He came to the house and he brought an orange. Now, Eastern Poland only saw oranges in pictures. Uh, very few had known of oranges. Uh, my mother brought some tangerines, I remember, but I've never seen an orange before. Bananas and tangerines were something of a, a luxury item. He came to the house and he told my grandfather, he says, it's not the same army that was here during World War I. You do not know me on the street, but I want you to know to be very careful. Of course, he moved on and conditions got worse. In, in fact, you were then forced into the ghetto. Little by little, everything got constricted. Jews were forced into one area. Do you want to bring up the, the map with the area? We can't, we can't do we that can't once do we're that. here, okay. yeah. Uh, they were forced into one area, a number of square blocks, actually the area surrounding the synagogue. There were several synagogues and a big area of, like a plaza in between. And our house happened to be on a main street and it was not far from the synagogue. It also had gates in the front that opened up when my father brought stuff in. Uh, I want you to know that most of the transportation was by horse and buggy. We were not on the railroad um, tracks. We didn't have a railroad station. It was about six kilometers away. And so in order to bring in stuff that my father had purchased to the warehouse, there was a big gate in the front. Um, in the gate, of course, was a door to get, go out, and part of the house became one of the gates of the ghetto. So more people were pushed into the house. Of course, family first. And my mother was one of six, and all but one sibling were married. One lived out of town, but the other four were in town, and of course, they and their children. My father's a sister and her children, who were out of town but came back because they kind of, they thought they might, uh, they've heard more, they were uh, closer to the western side of, po of Poland. They heard more about the Nazis and they were trying to get away, and so they came to our town. And basically she took over, my father's sister took over the household. Uh, she and two daughters, the older one was married with a child, moved in with us too. Uh, my parents had probably, I don't know, I'd call it a double bed here. I don't know how wide it was, but all I know is that we all slept like sardines mm -hmm. on the bed. People rolled down bedding for the night, and at night it was hard to go by. Uh, during the day, of course, everybody rolled, out their, rolled up their bedding. Uh, the Nazis had everybody counted. They were, when the ghetto was first formed, everybody had to come to the plaza, uh, the synagogue plaza, and they counted everybody. They recorded everybody. Uh, if you're familiar with what the Nazis did, or if you're not, you may look it up. They kept records of everybody. They kept records of how many people were where. 
since they had a lot of soldiers stationed in the area, they needed workers. Uh, they selected workers from the ghetto. Normally, they chose people of a certain age and a certain built and a certain energy. Uh, they took people to service the military. They took people to improve roads because the German armies were not used to the type of roads that we had in our backwards area. And uh, so they, they were trying to build roads. They took people to the, where the railroad station was to improve that. Uh, it, the township there where the railroad station was was smaller, much smaller, and there weren't that many Jews there mm -hmm. to supply them with the labor. After we got settled in for a little bit, and I don't remember the dates, but they started what they called a resettlement program. They picked out a certain number of Jews, and I don't know the number, for resettlement. We found out that the resettlement, I think there was about 500 in the group, but I'm not sure. Uh, the resettlement turned out to be taking them to a pit and just gunned them down. The second time, they had three times that. That was the first time. Of course, people were aware of it. I actually know he came to the United States after the war, and he was with us after liberation. A boy who was shot in the leg, he was younger. They went through with a machine gun, either top or bottom, and people fell. They lined them up, and they were falling into the pit, and he was shot in the leg and wound up under corpses. At night, he managed to crawl out mm -hmm. and come back to his parents. He survived with both parents, and they came here to the United States eventually. But when they had the second, what they called resettlement, people did not come out so readily to be counted, and so they went from house to house and pulled out people. A few people escaped the ghetto. They went out on a work detail and basically escaped from the lines coming back and escaped to the forest. The area that I come from is very forested and mostly pine trees. There are also marshes. The Germans did not like to go into the marshes and they didn't want to go off the beaten paths. And so they hid and the way the Germans reacted to that as they asked the population again to come out to the plaza between the synagogues. They started to count people, of course. And by the way, I neglected to tell you that the ghetto was organized in such a way that they had what they called, they let the Jews rule themselves. They appointed a head of the committee and 10 committee people. There were three people that escaped. They were missing from the detail coming home. And so they requested 10 for one, 30 young men of approximately the same age and to be as the example. The committee offered themselves first and some of the older men offered themselves just to save the rest of the Jews in the ghetto. They would not accept it. They went through and made their own selections, lined them up, and shot them in front of the people that gathered in the place. Needless Ray? to say, go ahead, Ray. Needless to say, people hesitated to try to escape. And that, and that's what your mother decided. It was time to try to escape from there. Nope. Well, tell us, tell us about leaving there if uh, you could. Eventually, they were liquidating the whole ghetto. Mm -hmm. We had a hiding place between the house and the warehouse. There was a, a space. The walls did not attach, but it was all under one roof. And 
From what my mother told me, that was a place where my father kept important documents and some money and so forth and so on. And that became the area that my mother decided would be a hiding place once the Germans came to try to take people out of the houses. The final, what they call the final closing of the ghetto, again, under disguise of resettlement, people did not come out. We went into this hiding place, as many of us as could fit. There were some supplies there, some water, some dried bread, some I don't know what else, whatever there was that would keep. We heard the houses we were opened. Uh, the population, unfortunately, greedy, incited with hate, came and helped the Nazis pull people out of the houses. And of course, the houses were open to looting. We heard the looting, we heard the arguments over objects, you already got something, I want this, I want that. After it got quiet, some of the people couldn't stand the claustrophobia of this small place. And at night they would come out they were caught. We haven't heard of anybody who was able to escape. After about a week, when it calmed down, when it quieted down, the last segment went out and they were caught too. So we still remained. At the end, it was only my mother, my brother, and I, and two other children and my grandmother that were left in the hiding place. I guess my mother managed to keep enough for us to be able to survive. It got quiet for a long time. We didn't hear any commotion in the house. And at night, we ventured out. There was also another hiding place in a pantry, a root cellar. We got out. And we were waiting for my grandmother. And we heard some noises. Some people were still coming in. We rushed into the root cellar, my mother, my brother, and I, and the two other kids. My grandmother, being much slower, was behind us. She saw them coming. She quickly covered us, acted crazy. She was taken away. We stayed in the root cellar overnight, and the next night it was impossible to stay there. We ventured out. Mother had some valuables on her. Actually, the Nazis, I mean, there was so much to tell. The Nazis had uh, asked for ransom in order to be able to stay in the ghetto for the privilege. And so a lot of people had to give up their valuables it also came down to silver, gold, of course, was first. Any kind of money was collected. Uh, it came down to silver and silver objects and even brass and copper and eventually even any kind of uh, iron utensils that were used for cooking, skillets and pots because everything they wanted for the war effort, what they kept amongst themselves and what went for the war effort, who knows. But mother happened to conceal a few valuables. And on the second night after my grandmother was taken, we ventured out of the ghetto. One of the borders of the ghetto was a river. It was called the Berezina, I remember that, simply because I remember learning that Napoleon had his downfall on the Berezina, not in our part, because mm. that's where the river started. It was pretty narrow there. It was a good-sized river. We used to go swimming on, in it, and it would freeze over in the winter, and we'd go ice skating on it. We crossed the river, and there were two, two men with rifles guarding the ghetto. Mother knew who they were. They knew who she was. 
She told them, I have some valuables. Let us go. I was always good to you. You got credit whenever you needed it and whatever you wanted. I've never stepped on your toes. Please let us go. She asked them to bring, put out their palms. She'll put whatever she has in their palms, whatever valuables, to let us go. Well, they put out their palms. Mother put, she had a, a woman's watch that was worn on a heavy gold chain. She put it in the arms of one and she kind of tied the, or that's the way she told me, tied the, um, the necklace a little bit around it, the gold chain. The other one she gave whatever other trinket she has. They put their rifles, of course, on their shoulder in order to get it and they went, had to have time to put it away. And in that time, she took our hands and ran. Of course, the other kids were running too, but we lost them. We don't know where they went. Mm -hmm. We went to a farmer that I told you we used to go there at Christmas time. And he said he would keep my brother and told my mother where his sister was and she would probably keep me. And mother figured as long as she put us in safe hands, she didn't care about herself. My brother was left with this farmer and my mother and I went to the other house where the woman fed us and gave us some clothing and mother was making arrangements with her when word came to her that uh, this particular farmer's mother-in-law got mad at him for keeping my brother and went to the Nazis, to the Germans there, the SS and told them that he's harboring a Jewish child. Well, needless to say, they came right away. The farmer would not tell them where my brother was. He was someplace in one of the barns with his son. And they beat him up quite badly because we met him after liberation and he was crippled in one leg. The mother-in-law had to live with that, needless to say. By the time we came out of the ghetto, she wasn't there anymore. She must have passed away. But, I mean, when we came back after liberation. But my brother was taken away. Word came about us and the woman that was hiding us, she was a widow and a good friend of my mother's and she gave us some food, she told us the farmers did not have um, bathing facilities in their, in their houses, needless to say. They didn't have toilets in their houses either. They were all outhouses. And so they, on Saturday, they would go to get their baths in this bathhouse, but during the week, they were all busy with their work, tending to the farms, and not care very much about bathing every night like we do. And so we went and we spent the day in this bathhouse. At night, she brought us some more food and we left. Ray, um, we, I'm, we're, I'm very mindful of our time. I know, that's and, why. And I, if, if you could, uh, okay, tell us I'll make what... It, I'll make it short. Yeah, tell us, tell we us. went from farm to farm okay. until we reached the house of a woman, she was actually French, she married a Polish soldier. And she hid us overnight, dressed us in her garments, it was market day the next day. She was afraid to hide us because she had to depend on the neighboring farmers to help with the farm. So, she dressed us, my mother in her clothing, me in her daughter's clothing. Her daughter was approximately my age and an older son drove the wagon with the produce to the market in Glamboki, the bigger city, where there was still a goodly number of Jews. That population day of the city was about 30,000 and there was a big contingent of Jews living there. When we got to the marketplace, we got out of the wagon. <coughs> mm -hmm. 
smuggled our way into the ghetto with the work people that came back from assignments. Mother started to make arrangements. We knew that they were partisans. <coughs> Excuse me. Some Russian prisoners of war that were badly mistreated ran in force. Some of them were killed and some of them escaped to the forest and they organized themselves as a resistance to the Nazis. We knew where they were and mother even managed to contact on market day a friend of my father's who brought her a gun in a basket of eggs. The Nazis would not look for anything that if they happened to dislodge an egg and who would ever think of a gun in some straw because the basket had straw on the bottom so the eggs wouldn't break. While some of the eggs my mother left in the ghetto, she made arrangements. I'm kind of coming through it very briefly. Mm -hmm. Ooh. And we again left on market day. Mother knew the area very well because she dealt with a lot of people there. And we made our way to one of the villages that was at the edge of the forest. We managed to contact some of the partisans. There was a small group, a reconnaissance group, that was at the edge of the forest. They accepted my mother as their cook, and she told them she knows the area and so forth, which was of benefit to them, and of course she had a gun. And that was our entry ticket to this reconnaissance group that we stayed with in, 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 until... Okay. Tell us, um, w one of the things I would You're want to... You're never going to get it in in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> well, one of the things I do want you to t talk about, two things in particular. Um, you were with this, this group of partisans in the woods with your mom yes. cooking for them, as you said. Describe what happened when you were captured by the Germans. Oh, that and, was going to lead up to yeah, that. Yeah, th that we have time to hear about. Uh, we stayed with this group, and... I happened to have gotten sick with typhus. Typhus was a very contagious disease and the partisans had actually organized themselves so well. And when the front lines got stabilized in 19, the end of 1942, 42, with the beginning of 43, 43, they actually established a, what they called quote unquote hospital. Uh, many of the partisans who went out on skirmishes to disrupt the German progress to the front lines uh, and were wounded or got sick were taken to this hospital. Fortunately for me, the woman that was the, I should say, acted as the head, head nurse there because there were no doctors. She was a midwife, uh, a young midwife actually, just graduated. And she knew how to sew up wounds and mm -hmm. <laughs> how to tend to sick. And so my mother took me to her and she kind of got me back to, I wouldn't say health, but at least surviving because many of the people died from this sickness. Typhus is a very bad illness. It's transmitted with lice and needless to say, hygiene was not one of the primary conditions there. Uh, we were not with our group when the front lines were starting to push the Nazis out. Uh, the United States entered the war, supplied Russia with an awful lot of supplies, war supplies, maybe proud of the United States, and started to, the Nazis started to try to get the partisans dis dislodged because they had a front in the front and they had a front in the back. And so the partisans dispersed. We were not with our group, we were on our own. And 
we were caught by the Nazis, brought to our own hometown where my mother was afraid to show her face. We were, stored, we were all in a warehouse. I was dressed like a boy. My head was shaved. And eventually, the Nazis, according to, to their norm, started to separate the men from the women. They couldn't decide whether I was a boy or a girl. I understood the German. German is very similar to Yiddish. And I was being separated from my mother. I just told them I was a girl. I said, Mädchen. They decided I'm a Jewish child. Mother came out. She says, no, she's not. She's my daughter. She's a girl. She had typhus. That's why she has no hair on her head. And they put us on the gallows. They told my mother to tell the truth that I'm Jewish. They would hang me, but they would let her go. Because they thought she was not Jewish and she was protected. She protect thought she, she was, was not Jewish. Yeah. Who knows what was in their yeah. minds? Yeah. All I can say is that mother pleaded with them. She said, hang me first, because I don't want to see my child die. And I guess somebody must have had a softer heart mm -hmm. and said to my mother, well, I believe you, because why would you give your life for a Jew? Mm -hmm. And so they let us go. She told them she was, a la she was doing <coughs> laundry for the German uh, soldiers, and I, being a child, have learned a few words. And they actually gave me an extra portion of bread. The farmers, the, the women, were told to go back to their villages. We had no place to go. We were homeless. We were Jewish. We were afraid. So mother picked a village that was very far away and was still in the fighting zones. And so the women, of course, with the child had pity on us and some of them let us stay, especially the, it, it was not just us, it was others. Uh, they were housing people on their way back to their villages. Mm -hmm. We were on the move to where God only knew. Eventually, we were in one of the villages and word got out, somebody recognized my mother. She was afraid to show her face, really. She had wrapped her, her head in a kerchief. She had very dark black hair. And the custom was to wear a kerchief to the forehead and tied. And so she was able to get away with it. Her, Belarus language was very good because being in business and conducting business with the population, nobody recognized that. And her Russian was good, but she decided to speak Polish mostly. Mm -hmm. So they labeled her as one of the higher caliber Polish people and they hated those, so they didn't, <laughs> they, they didn't communicate with her much, which was to her advantage and to our advantage. I ran with the kids. If they went in the fields to try to find a potato or a carrot, I did the same thing. And that's how we sustained ourselves. Needless to say, most of the people were moving on to their villages. We were a little slower. Eventually, somebody recognized my mother. Actually, a, a couple of people recognized my mother, but one woman who had a better heart or was, did not have as much hate in her, told my mother, she says, they used to call her Dorka. Her name is, was Dina. Dorka, somebody has recognized you and threatening to find some Germans and tell them about you. You have to go. We were on the road again. But at that time, the front lines have moved on enough and we found out where some of the partisan units were getting 
organi reorganized, and so we joined with them and were liberated in the spring of 19... In, I'm sorry, it was the fall of 1943. Right? Yeah. It was 43. We went to the larger city, to Glenbokia, where we found some Jewish families in one house. We joined with them. I was, mother enrolled me right away in school, Russian school. And she was trying to make her way. Some of the farmers who had received some of the stuff from my mother, actually clothing and even a sewing machine she gave to one of them. They were friends, but they were afraid because they lived in very close proximities and they were afraid of their neighbors who would expose them. So even though they were not willing to hide us, they were willing to help us at that time. However, we all lived in one house and somebody got into the house and actually killed someone, killed a Jew mm -hmm. that was sleeping on the porch. And so it became evident that we couldn't hang around there very long. Ray, I'm gonna... The picture, the picture. Uh, yes, I, I'm gonna, I, wanna, I wanted to get to that before we close up. Um, if we could spend the rest of the afternoon and we would only touch on all that Ray um, could share with us, so we've, we've, um, there's just not enough time to cover all of it. Um, what you would have heard if we had more time is, is that what they went through continued for much longer because the war continued until May 1945. Um, Ray's mother, who was just an amazing human being, who lived to 100 years old, yes. um, you know, found a, a home for them on a train moving with the Russian army to the stand moving towards the front lines eventually ended up, as we said in the beginning, in displaced persons camp, in came Italy. to the U.S. in 1947. Yeah. Ray, that photograph that we showed at the beginning, tell us about that photograph. That photo is the only thing that I have from my former life. A woman that was a neighbor. My mother went back to our hometown, of course. Where do you look for any survivors? She found no one. But this woman gave her this photograph that was so wrinkled, you can see that it was almost crushed. She saved it. She said that was the only memento of my mother she had. She invited my mother into her house. She says, there is nothing here of yours. I didn't loot. I was appalled at what was happening. She gave my mother this picture that of course we cherished. That was the only one that we have of my brother. Mm -hmm. She told my mother she would be happy to let her spend the night. However, she thought that either both she and my mother would be dead by morning. That's how incited the people were by the Nazis. Mother enlisted as a former partisan, she was given the opportunity to enlist into the workforce, the Russian workforce. We lived on a train in a boxcar. If you've been upstairs, you saw the boxcars. We had about a quarter of it as our quarters for whatever supplies she could take along for the road. Eventually, she managed to get our boxcar attached to a train that was going south into Poland where there was a big gathering of Jews and from there, we made our way on foot, sometimes travel, all the way to Italy. And, and that journey took you across many countries. You were misdirected. You went back. It's, it's All I can say is I learned geography on foot. <laughs> um, we, um, we obviously didn't have time for questions from you. But Ray, after she finishes, we're I gonna, can stay. We're going to turn back to Ray in just a minute to close the program. But she will. She's willing to stay behind. We invite anybody who wants to come up on the stage, meet Ray, um, have your picture taken with her, or ask her the, any questions that you, you might have. 
I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, we will have two first-person programs <coughs> next week that will end our 2018 year. We'll resume again in 2019. All of our programs are on the museum's YouTube page, so you can view this program with Ray as well as our other programs, and we hope that you will do that. A reminder that if anybody would like to be briefly interviewed afterwards about what it was like for you as a museum visitor to talk with a survivor, uh, you're welcome to do that afterwards because of this special program to, to honor survivors that will be held a little bit later. Um, when Ray is finished, um, one last request for you. Our photographer, Joel, is gonna come up on the stage and take a picture of Ray with you as the background. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful photo for, for Memento, so please stay see, or with us for that if you don't mind. It's our tradition at first person that our first person has the last word. And so with that, I'd like to turn to Ray to close our program. I will leave you with a very short message. Don't be incited into hate. Don't follow those that lead you into a bad path. Have compassion. That's the most important thing. And for kids, value your family. You cannot replace them. Thank you.